Robert Novak, it's uh, certainly a happy occasion to have you back at your alma mater, and certainly on a wonderful day as a new laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. Well, I'm really honored. I'd um, like to talk to you about your early influences. You grew up in Joliet, not too far up the road from here. How did you first get, get interested in journalism? I can't remember when I wasn't interested in journalism. We used to do a little neighborhood uh, paper, which I was the editor of, and we had a little neighborhood gossip, and my mother typed it up, and we distributed it around, and uh, my by the time I was a uh, freshman in high school, I was uh, writing sports for a weekly newspaper, and then I graduated into the daily newspaper, and uh, they, thought I th they thought I had some promise, so they hired me as a part-time employee uh, by the time I was uh, 16 years old. Who were your early influences? Well, I was, uh, I was a tremendously influenced, this sounds crazy, by Drew Pearson. I thought he was, uh, he was terrific because he, uh, he had a column. They ran the column in my, in my hometown paper, the Joy at Herald News, and he had all this inside information that you, nobody else knew. I said, wouldn't that be a great thing to have a job where you found out things other people didn't know? And then he was on the radio every Sunday night with more inside information. So I wasn't very ideological at all, but I just thought he was a, he was a lot of fun. And uh, I, I all, it sounds a little converse. As I got a little older, somebody was the, the polar opposite of Walter, of, uh, of Joe Pearson was uh, Walter Lippmann. And uh, uh, I, I was very impressed by his, uh, uh, his cool, dispassionate analysis. Those were two early influences. Very interesting that they were they were columnists. <laughs> you came to work at uh, you came to school at the University of Illinois. You worked on the daily paper here. Uh, tell me about uh, tell me about that experience. Were there any particular professors who sort of left their mark on you? Yeah, I I didn't go to journalism school uh, because I had I'd been working on the Joliet paper and I thought I knew all the nuts and bolts of that they would teach me in journalism school. That's a terrible thing to say, I guess, but. Uh, so I majored in English, and they had a professor here uh, named George Scoofus. I don't know if the name means anything to you. He just passed away about two years ago. He got a great deal, uh, got several awards, and uh, uh, he was a, a he taught literature and he taught uh, uh, writing and uh, uh, creative writing. And he had a great influence on me in cleaning up my prose. He, uh, uh, I, I knew all the nuts and bolts how to write a newspaper story who, how, when, and all that, but I, I needed a lot of help in, 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 uh, in really learning how to write. And I think George Scoop has really taught me how to write. And in the, uh, the years that I started coming back here uh, until he passed away, we always, uh, we always met. And, uh, uh, and he had a great influence also on another uh, much better writer than I am, who is now dead, named Stanley Elkin, the great novelist, uh, one of the really great American novelists. He was uh, in the same writing class with me, uh, with uh, Professor Scoofus. You were in the service, and then you went to work for the Associated Press. Do I have the chronology right? Exactly. What was writing? How did it? Uh, how, how was writing for the Wire different? Well, the, the great thing about writing for the Wire was that uh, you had to be fast, particularly. Uh, my first bureau was Omaha, which was a very small bureau, and uh, uh, I was I was writing the white radio wire, and I was writing news stories at the same time. I would, in a, in a given day, I, it was not surprising that I'd write twenty twenty five stories in a day. So, speed was uh, was the premium, and and accuracy because uh, you didn't have much editing. It uh, it it went pretty well straight from from your typewriter to the wire. When you started, uh, when did you start working in politics, covering the legislatures? Uh, after after working three months in Omaha, they thought I was a, a fast young reporter and uh, uh, didn't take uh, very inexpensive transfers. So they sent me to Lincoln to cover the legislative session, which lasted six months. That was my first legislature, and and that helped me to get uh, transferred to Indianapolis, where I also covered the legislature and politics. And then from there, uh, uh, when I was 26 years old, to uh, to Washington Bureau, which was very unusual in those days. In journalism, you've got to be uh, lucky, and uh, uh, I, that was extraordinarily lucky. Not so unusual today to, to be a 26-year-old reporter in the Washington Bureau of the AP. When, um, when you got into politics, started covering politics, what lit a fire in you there? 
Well, it, it, what lit a fire was what fascinated me about Drew Pearson when I was a kid, and what still lets fire me at my advanced age, and that is finding out things that nobody else knows. Uh, now, I'm, I have become ideological as time has gone by. I, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I think anybody who deals with politics and ends up with no opinions and ideas is is a neuter. But uh, still, what gets me excited is when I really find out something that that uh, other people don't know, and that that's why. Uh, uh, even though I'm a columnist, I think I still think of myself as a reporter. One of the things I like about your columns is the fact that you are still reporting. You're not just sitting in some ivory tower, uh, you know, uh, as you said, contemplating your navel like some of your like some of your colleagues might do. You're actually talking to people and working the, working the story. Well, that's all I know how to do. And uh, uh, when we started our column with Roland Evans, uh, I had spent after the AP, I went with the Wall Street Journal, and I spent uh, five years with the Journal, and then. Evans and I started this column, which was kind of a shot in the dark. But uh, we decided that we would, in every column, have at least one fact that has never been published anywhere. And I still try to do that, and I do it. Uh, now, uh, some people think some of the facts that are unpublished and are, are trivial. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're, they're important. But uh, that, that's kind of a, a, a little discipline that I use that uh, that that makes you go out and uh, do some reporting. Tell me about the partnership with Evans. Uh, I had, I was only uh, 31 years old, and uh, actually uh, 32 years old, and uh, he was 10 years older than I, and uh, I didn't know him very well, and he came to me. Uh, he was with the Herald Tribune, and he said that he'd been trying to get a column with the Herald Tribune for all these years, and they wanted him to do a column, and they wanted it six times a week, and they wanted it a news-oriented column. He couldn't do that. And he wondered if I would become his partner. And uh, uh, those are the kind of decisions you make uh, that affect your whole life because I, I had a great future with the Wall Street Journal. But what appealed to me about, about it was the idea that I would uh, be on my own. I'd be an independent contractor, so to speak, although I'd have a partner, but I wouldn't be a, an employee as much. And so it was, a, it was a shot in the dark. I know my my parents always thought that things I was doing, even going into journalism, was uh, insane. But they really thought leaving the Wall Street Journal for this was uh, didn't make much sense. But uh, uh, and I think I would have had a good good career and a good life if I had stayed at the Journal. But this this was something that was a I think was the right decision. I want to take one little step back, and that is when you came to Washington, and that was what fifty seven. Fifty seven. Fifty seven. What was Washington like then? Compared to what it is like oh, today, oh, it's so different. It was it was still uh, an overgrown southern town. Didn't have the fancy she she restaurants. Uh, you didn't have the big law firms. Government was much smaller, and there was just the the, the color green as green in money, not in uh, chlorophyll, was uh, was much uh, was much less of a factor in those days. Uh, New York has always been a money town. Now Washington is a money town. It, it wasn't in those days. It was, it was a much, uh, much simpler place. And uh, I, I came with the, the Wall Street uh, with the Associated Press, and uh, about my second week there, they assigned me as the number three man on the Senate Rackets Committee, which means I did the overnight stories and, uh, and uh, filled in when the, when the big shots were writing the leads. Great assignment for a 26-year-old. So I got to meet immediately Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Barry Goldwater, uh, Edward Benner Williams, Jimmy Hoffa. Those were my Pierre Salinger. Those were my news sources. So it was a uh, it was really uh, really exciting. Bob Michael, who was also a Lincoln laureate, uh, former House Minority Leader, uh, was telling me when we we had this this interview, he said it was there was much more civility. There was an opportunity to, after you had it out on the floor, you could go over to Sam Rayburn's office and have uh, have a little whiskey and sit down and talk like like gentlemen. That's true, and and uh, it was more civility between the media and the, and the and the uh, uh, and the journalists and and the politicians. Uh, politicians uh, in those days, people used to drink more than they do now. I don't know if that was good or bad, but they would. They would have these little uh, salons in their office at the end of the day, and very often 
uh, uh, a, uh, a senator or a congressman would invite as a regular or a semi-regular a reporter that he liked. For example, uh, I was a semi-regular in the uh, late afternoon drinking in Senator Dirksen's office. Dirksen liked me. I was from Illinois. He was from Illinois, and I could keep a secret. And, uh, and I learned a lot. I learned about how the system worked. The other thing that was different in those days, 42 years ago, is that uh, there was more of a social life among the politicians, sometimes inviting the press in. Uh, they didn't go home every weekend. Now they go home every weekend. And there was much less fundraising because there was much less money. So they had, there was much more of a, of a social life of entertaining in their home and not having uh, this constant uh, fundraisers. Uh, I think being, being a member of Congress in those days was a lot of fun. I don't know if I'd recommend it to anybody right now. That is, and that's one of the things that uh, it's tough when, when people like Bob Michael and Paul Simon and uh, people who have gone from politics to education are trying to get people young people interested in a life of public service. It's darn hard to do that given the amount of scrutiny and the winner-take-all, take-no-prisoners kind of mentality that takes place. And, and all, all of the above that you've mentioned, plus, plus they need to raise these enormous amounts of money. And the reason for that is that, the camera, mm -hmm. that uh, it costs, you must, even to run for Congress in a contested area, you must go on television and Television is expensive, mm -hmm. and and so the the story of Washington now is a much bigger symbiotic relation with lobbyists because the lobbyists raise the money, they contribute the money, and therefore they have access. What's the remedy? Uh, well, I have a remedy that uh, seventy percent of the American people think it's a good idea, and about a hundred about zero percent of the politicians think it's a good idea, and that's term limits. Now, you say, you mean uh, you would have uh, tremendous uh, figures like uh, Bob Michael and Henry Hyde from Illinois and uh, uh, just have their careers cut off at whatever it is, six years or eight years? That's a loss. But I, th I believe the payoff is that you would have people who uh, are, are, are indeed citizen legislators, as they were in an earlier day in the previous century, who come to Washington uh, for a brief time and are not that dependent on the job, are not that uh, hooked to, to raising all this money. Now, I'll tell you something else, and as a conservative, I, I don't swim with my brethren on this. I'm for campaign finance reform. I'm for real campaign finance reform, which affects la organized labor and affects business as well. I think, uh, I think some kind of restrictions on the present system are, are necessary. But I believe that it, if, if, it, if it is molded into a reform of, of term limits, it would work better. Talking about soft money. Soft money, uh, PAC money, uh, the, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, the, you have campaigns for the Senate where almost all the money is raised outside of the person's state in Hollywood or New York. Uh, it's a, it is a, there are reforms that can be done without violating the First Amendment, but but uh, uh, the, the politicians are almost opposed to that as they are opposed to term limits. I want to talk to you about some of the, some of the interesting people you've met. Uh, you, your interview with Deng Xiaoping was, was one that in many ways uh, people have credited that for opening up a real a rapprochement, a, a, a rapport with, uh, with, with China. How do you feel about influencing the path of history by what you've done? Well, that was probably the biggest thing I ever did. He gave me, uh, he had never had an interview with a uh, Western correspondent before. He gave me two hours, and he laid out what it would take. Because, see, we didn't have diplomatic relations then, mm -hmm. formal diplomatic relations. And uh, he laid out, he sent a message, what it would take to, um, to establish normalization. And he made it very clear that we didn't have to abandon uh, Taiwan. We didn't have to abandon South Korea. It was a much more mild uh, proposal than it was. So I, f I felt uh, uh, good in influencing that in, in a positive way. Uh, I get worried sometimes about, about uh, influencing uh, the course of history. I, I often say uh, I unintentionally elected uh, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> now, let me tell you how. I did a, uh, a column about uh, a uh, 
something I call the Sonnenfeld Doctrine. Sonnenfeld was a high-ranking State Department official, and he had read a, written a secret do memo saying that, uh, uh, that we should not interfere with the part of Europe that was now under communist control, Soviet control, like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. We should let them have their area. And I wrote this, and it was a, uh, a sensational column. Uh, Jimmy Carter started bothering Ford whether he, he, he uh, believed in the Sonnenfeld Doctrine. So in their first debate, uh, Ford was challenged under President Ford. The problem was that he got it mixed up. Instead of saying, we don't think that it should be communist, he said, Poland is not communist. And if you remember, that, uh, that is not Soviet-controlled, and that, uh, that really, uh, for the first time, put Carter in the lead. Must be a, that must be a funny feeling. <laughs> Particularly when it's unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know we don't have very much more time left, but I, I want to ask you, um, what, has given, what has given you the most satisfaction about the, the kind of work that you're, that you're allowed to do? I, I guess it's the greatest satisfaction in my, my closing year, in my fi final years, I guess. I've been at it now uh, for a long I'm 68 years old and uh, working harder than I've ever worked. But I really do believe that uh, apart from make, doing scoops and meeting fascinating people like Lyndon Johnson and, uh, and Richard Nixon and, uh, and having a, a front seat in history, uh, I really believe that the most important thing in this country is freedom. I worry about whether we're losing our freedom, whether the government is intruding on it, whether people are worried enough, and the whatever small uh, contributions I think I can make uh, to saying that that freedom is important uh, too. How we, uh, the freedom to use our money, the freedom to live our lives as we uh, see fit, uh, which is really the great American tradition. If I have just a tiny influence on that, that is very satisfying. In terms of uh, the last remarkable year that we've had in politics in this country, uh, what uh, what kind of lead would you write for the Clinton presidency? I would say a lost opportunity, a uh, a failed uh, a failed presidency, in that uh, this man came into the presidency with tremendous ambitions to be not just a a two-term president but a great president, to to go down as one of the great presidents. And because of his personal uh, failings, because he uh, could not transcend uh, petty politics and personal uh, uh, shortcomings, uh, it may be it would be a disappointing presidency. And if, as we sit here today, this what I think insane war in the Balkans continues, uh, it will be a truly failed presidency. One thing I'd like to follow up on, you're hard on the Democrats, but you appear to me to be equally hard on your fellow Republicans. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hard on the Republicans. The Republicans, uh, 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 Republicans say I'm an anti-Republican conservative, and I'll, I'll buy that any time. Uh, I, uh, I think journalists should be hard on politicians. Uh, uh, they know what I stand for. I stand for tax cuts, less government, deregulation, and freedom. That's not exactly the liberal agenda, but it isn't very much the Republican agenda either because uh, when it comes down to it, they like government too and they like uh, their political perquisites. So uh, 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 I think to, to be an accurate reporter, to tell the truth and uh, uh, not worry about uh, whether you are uh, spoiling the... Uh, uh, spoiling the prospects for the, for the for one part or the other uh, is what we're supposed to do. Let me just say one thing. One of the one of the Republican leaders called me up last year and he said that uh, I was too rough, rough on the Republicans. He said, you know, he said, he said the trouble with you, Bob, is that uh, you've been tackling uh, the uh, congressional leaders for years with the ball. You get them in the dirt and you knock them down. He said, but you're still tackling us. This, and now you're tackling your own team. And I said, Senator, let me tell you something. I'm not on your team. <laughs> and that is the truth. I'm not on anybody's team, but, and I don't think any journalist should be on anybody's team. 
As a native son of Illinois, what does what does becoming a Lincoln laureate mean to you? Well, it means it means a great deal to me. Uh, I the last year, full year, I lived in Illinois. A whole twelve months was 1951. That's a long time ago. Lived in Washington for 42 years. But when somebody says to me, "Where are you from?" Just just I always say, Illinois. I don't consider myself a Washingtonian, certainly. I'm from Illinois. And so I'm, I'm terribly proud. I don't know if I'm, des honestly, don't, don't know whether uh, just a journalist is deserving of this, considering that other people are getting the honor. But uh, I'm terribly proud of it because I, cause Illinois means a lot to me, not only the fact that uh, my grandfather was, a, was an immigrant and sent, uh, came, worked, and made tractors in the Moline uh, John Deere plant, and uh, sent four sons to the University of Illinois, all of whom got degrees. Uh, I'm a University of Illinois graduate, but I, I do believe that the the prairie tradition, the tradition of uh, of self-reliance, of independence, and of freedom, uh, has had a great influence in me and in in, uh, in shaping the kind of person I've tried to be and the kind of journalist I've tried to be. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.